Laura Polari Welbus. I'm with Encore Learning, and we're, our program today is Dr. Tyler Anbinder on the Irish immigrants rising against the odds. Uh, in a moment, uh, Terry Smith our, will introduce our speaker, and then we'll have our speaker. Well, yeah, I'm Terry Smith, and I'm really honored to uh, uh, start this present. Well, actually, introduce uh, our speaker, Tyler Anbinder, who will discuss the latest book. Uh, the Plentiful Country uh, a different, gives a different perspective on the Irish immigrants who came to this, this country. Um, but uh, he is, you know, very well known as a, an award-winning author. He has, uh, as well as being a professor emeritus of history and former chair of the history department of George Washington University, he is author of three award-winning books, Nativism and Slavery, winner of the Avery Craven Prize of the Organization of American Historians, Five Points, winner of the New York City Book Prize of 2001, and City of Dreams, winner of the Mark Linden Prize for History. And he was also a consultant on Martin Scorsese's film, Gangs of New York. So without going much further, I want to introduce um, Dr. Tyler and Binder. Take it away. All right. Thank you. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is share my screen. So let's see here. One second to do that. And then back to Zoom. We go. All right. Oops. So, well, thank you all for coming. It's great to be here and help out with Encore Learning's great slate of events. What I'm going to be talking about today is my forthcoming book. It's actually not going to be published for another 11 months. And as Terry told you, the title is, uh, the title is Plentiful Country, The Great Potato Famine and the Making of Irish New York. And the book looks at the immigrants who came to the United States as a result of the Great Potato Famine, which started in 1845 and lasted for more than half a decade, as year after year the potato crop failed in Ireland, um, causing an Ireland at the beginning, at the, at the beginning of the uh, potato blight had about 8 million residents. Of those 8 million, 1 million died as a result of the famine from starvation or starvation-related diseases. About 1.5 million of those 8 million left Ireland, uh, fleeing for their lives. And 1.1 of those, I'm sorry, 1.3 of those 1.5 million who left Ireland came to the United States. And most of those uh, Irish who came to the United States landed in New York and more of them settled in New York City than any other place. And so what I'm gonna look at here in the next 45 minutes is, uh, are, is the lives that those Irish immigrants made for themselves in America. Um, so let's start our story right here with um, uh, this cabin in Southwest Ireland. If you look down here at the little inset map, you can see down here at the very Southwestern corner of Ireland, was what was known as the Lansdowne Estate. It was a uh, piece of land that was about 100 square miles that was owned by one English uh, nobleman, the Marquis of Lansdowne. At this time when the uh, potato famine starts, he's the chancellor of the exchequer of the British government. And he's got thousands of tenants who live on his property. Now, the Marquis hardly ever visited Ireland. He would go maybe once a decade, but he uh, his riches were brought about primarily from the rents that his agents collected for him from the peasants who lived on this land. And two of those peasants were John Lane and Dennis Sullivan, who lived um, in a cabin much like this one. This is a replica um, of a cabin on the Lansdowne estate that you can go visit today in a, in a national park in Southwest Ireland. And Dennis Lane and uh, John, Dennis Sullivan and John Lane had a lot in common. They were both born on this uh, rocky mountainous uh, territory in Southwest Ireland. 
They both managed to survive five years of the famine from 1846 to 1851. In 1851, they both made it to America with tickets paid for by the Marquis of Lansdowne. The way the, the British poor laws worked was the landlords had to pay to support um, tenants who were too poor to support themselves. And with the potato famine, uh, the Marquis of Lansdowne found himself uh, on, on uh, the hook to pay for the support of thousands of his tenants. And so he finally decided after a half a decade of famine that it made uh, more financial sense simply to give them all tickets to go to America rather than keep paying to feed these people whose crops were, um, were being destroyed by this potato blight. So Lane and Sullivan uh, come to New York, and this is where they arrive. Um, in the neighborhood known as Five Points, which is now, if you're familiar with New York City, kind of where Chinatown is now, and exactly to be precise, where Chinatown kind of meets the, uh, the courthouse district. And so John Lane moved into this big brick tenement, which was 31 Baxter Street, and it's labeled H there on your map. Dennis Sullivan moved into this wooden frame tenement, uh, 6 Little Water Street, which is labeled C on this little map. So they're living very close to each other, just like they had in Ireland. And at first, their lives are very similar. They both get jobs as day laborers, um, and that means going to construction sites each day and doing things like hauling, digging, um, heaving, and those kinds of things, right? Pretty much everything that's done by machines today on a construction site in the 1850s was done by uh, Irish day laborers in the 1850s. And so Lane and Sullivan get that kind of work. Now at that point, however, their, their life stories diverge. Sullivan remains a day laborer and lives within this one block area um, in five points for the entire rest of his life. He works for 30 years as a construction day laborer, does so till the day he dies in 1880. John Lane, on the other hand, um, has a very different story. After about five years in New York, um, he saves his money and saves enough that he opens a saloon right here in one of these storefronts. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, in one of these storefronts in his tenement. So opens a saloon right there. Um, eventually he decides that's not a good location. He moves it across the street and then down the block. And after about a decade of running a saloon in Five Points, he decides he can do better by moving to a neighborhood where the residents have more money. And so he moves uptown to the west side and sets up a saloon near the Hudson River docks. And he does so well as a saloon keeper that he's eventually able to buy the tenement that his saloon sits in. And then after another decade, he's done so well between uh, his saloon and making money renting out the, the apartments in the tenement he owns that he's able to retire in his late 40s and just live off the income uh, he makes as a landlord. And he lives that way for several decades until he too dies right about the same time as Dennis Sullivan around 1880. Yet one remains a day laborer his whole life, the other uh, becomes a fairly well-to-do saloon keeper and landlord. And so the question is, which is more common? The story of Dennis Sullivan, the lifelong day laborer, or the life of John Lane, who becomes a saloon keeper and a landlord? Now, if you looked at the stories that were told back in the time of the potato famine itself, and this is a, uh, on the screen here on the left, is a guide for emigrants that was uh, particularly aimed at Irish immigrants. And guides like this, and the popular um, uh, literature of the time said that the Irish did really well in America. That it started out like this, ill-clad with hardly, you know, so few belongings they could fit in a little uh, kerchief on the back of a stick. And then you came to America and after a while, here you are with a tablecloth on your, on your table and a hearth to sit by and you've got your own servant to, to serve you. That was the kind of story that was told at the time. However, by the time we get to the 20th century, historians start to tell a different story. They say that life was uh, really hard for the famine immigrants, that most of them were locked in poverty even after they got to America. And this, historians have argued, is because um, the Irish immigrants 
um, were discriminated against. There was so much anti-Catholicism and anti-Irish sentiment um, because they lacked things like education. A large number of the famine immigrants were illiterate and they lacked vocational training. Most of the famine immigrants had been farmers, potato farmers in Ireland, and thus they really didn't bring any skills uh, marketable skills to America that would help them get higher paying jobs. Recently, some historical records have become available that help us settle this debate, uh, if you want to call it that. And these are the records of the Emigrant Savings Bank. The Emigrant Savings Bank was opened in New York City in 1850, specifically by Irish immigrants, but Irish immigrants who had come to America a generation before the famine and had done well, they opened a bank specifically for Irish immigrants, the famine immigrants. And they did so hoping that if a bank was opened by the Irish for the Irish, it would make the Irish more likely to trust the bank, more likely to save their money and be able like John Lane to um, be successful. Now, the reason these uh, records are so uh, useful for historians is because um, and here's, here's an example of the records they kept. So when you open an account at the bank, they put the date, they give you your account number, and then they wrote down your name, your occupation, your address in New York City. And then they wrote down all this information about you that I've made bigger right here. And the reason they did that is, keep in mind, this is before government issued photo ID. So the bank was very afraid. What if somebody comes into the bank and they claim their Patrick Kelly, and they want their money, and they're not really Patrick Kelly, or maybe they're the wrong Patrick Kelly. So they wrote down, they asked for and wrote down all this information. So here is information about where this person was born. This person was a native of Rahud, six miles from Kells, famous for the Book of Kells, if you, if you know your uh, ancient history. And this is in County Meath in Ireland. And then it says when he arrived in the United States, it says the name of his father, who's dead, Philip, his mother, who is Catherine Ryan, um, has a brother in New York named James, and then sisters named uh, Anne, Jane, Mary, and Ellen, and a wife named Mary McFadden. Now, you could use all this information. So if, you, if this person came to the bank and said, in this case, his name was Peter Lynch, and said, I'm Peter Lynch, give me my money, they could say, well, if you're really Peter Lynch, what's your mother's maiden name? And in fact, the Emigrant Savings Bank is the first institution to use your mother's maiden name as a means of, of identification. Or they might ask the name of the ship you came on or the name of your youngest sister and, and use those means to, to ferret out uh, fraudsters. Now, Peter Lynch, who uh, the example I gave there, um, if we had tried to see what had happened to Peter Lynch after he opened his bank account, he opened a bank account, he said he was a day laborer, and then it's impossible using normal methods to, to figure out what happened to Peter Lynch. Even with the wonders of uh, the internet and the digitization of records, because there are, in 1860, there are 123 Peter Lynches in the United States. And dozens of them were born in Ireland and are, are about the right age as the Peter Lynch who opened a bank account. So there'd be no way to find what happened to that Peter Lynch day laborer. But using the records of the Emigrant Savings Bank, we can figure it out. So for example, um, when I said about looking for what happened to that Peter Lynch, um, at first it seemed impossible. There were just too many. Um, many of them were married to Marys. Um, others of them weren't married to Marys, but maybe the, the wife had died. So there's just no way to know. But finally, I came across this record, um, the 1885 Minnesota State Census. And what does it Lynch list? It lists a Peter Lynch, and he's living with four women who are about his age, but younger than him, one named Anne, one named Jane, one named Mary, one named Ellen, and then one male named James, matching exactly the five siblings that he listed in his uh, when he opened a bank account 34 years earlier. So using that, we're able to go to another source um, um, and find his the tombstone of the Peter Lynch who lives in this place. This is in Faxon, Minnesota, right along the Minnesota River in the Minnesota River Valley. And what do we find here? But uh, here's Peter Lynch's gravestone. And he says he is a native of Rahud County, Meath. So we're able to then use other documents to prove that this is the right Peter Lynch. And so it turns out what happened to Peter Lynch in 
He left New York before he had even lived there a decade, moved to Minnesota, and became a prosperous prairie farmer. So what I've done to write this book that I call Plentiful Country, which is, as I said, not yet out. It's going to be, it's going to be uh, uh, published St. Patrick's Day week next year in 2024, so March 12, 2024. What I've done is to use records like those of, of uh, Peter Lynch, multiplied many, many times, to try to figure out to what extent the, uh, to what extent the debate, to where the debate about famine immigrants should be settled. Did they end up like this, uh, these prints indicate going from poverty to respectability, or did they, as historians typically describe them, end up um, impoverished and barely struggling to survive um, uh, and, and uh, barely feed themselves? And so what I'm going to do today is take you through the story of the famine immigrants in New York. And the way I'm going to organize my talk is by using uh, a kind of device that you might see in a uh, freshman economics textbook at George Washington University, where I taught for a quarter century before I retired recently, and that's a socioeconomic ladder. And so what I've done here on the right is, is kind of made up um, the Irish American socioeconomic ladder as it existed in New York. The bottom rung were unskilled workers, day laborers like, um, like Peter Lynch started out as, like John Lane and like Dennis Sullivan started out as. Then the next higher rung up the ladder were peddlers. Peddlers didn't have much more status than day laborers, but they made a lot more money as we'll see. Then one more rung up the ladder are artisans. Those are carpenters, shoemakers, people of that sort. And these three rungs of the ladder make up what you, what are sometimes referred to as blue collar workers. Then the three higher rungs are what we'd call white collar workers. Um, the fourth rung there is not just clerks, though it's primarily clerks, but also civil servants, um, salesmen, agents, uh, people with jobs like that. Then next, business owners, uh, shopkeepers, uh, we'll talk about them. And then the highest rung on the ladder would be professionals, doctors and lawyers and clergymen. Now, very few of the famine immigrants had the, um, had the education to be able to really realistically aspire to be a doctor or a lawyer. So for most of them, for you know, 95 out of every 100, the most realistic uh, aspiration would be to become a business owner. And in particular, of all the kinds of businesses that uh, famine immigrants ran, the famine Irish most wanted to become saloon keepers. That was the uh, most profitable business, and it was the one that carried uh, the most respect in the Irish American community. Um, but there is that sixth rung, but I won't talk about that rung today because so few people managed to get to it. So to understand, to be able to answer the question of, you know, how well did the famine Irish do in America? How, to what extent were they able to, to use the common expression today, pull themselves up by their own bootstraps? Uh, you need to know where they started. So here's that same ladder and now broken down by percentages. And so these are the jobs that the famine immigrants had when they first arrived in America. Within one year of arriving in America, this is how the famine immigrants' jobs were divided up. So about half of them had jobs like day labor, like we talked about with uh, John Lane and Dennis Sullivan. As you can see, day labor, 80% of unskilled workers are day laborers. The other 20% have jobs like waiter, porter, cartman, things like that. Then the next rung are the peddlers, who we could call petty entrepreneurs, because in a sense they're business owners, but they don't have a physical address. And as you can see, only about 5% of the famine immigrants were in that category. Then another third were artisans, and these are primarily tailors, carpenters, and shoemakers. About 60% of all famine Irish artisans have one of these three skills. So as you can see, when they first arrive in America, 85% of the famine immigrants are working in blue collar jobs of one sort or another. The remaining 15 or so percent are in these white collar jobs. The majority of that remaining 
are in what I'd call lower status white collar jobs, mostly clerks, but also civil servants, agents, and so forth. Another 5% are able to start out right when they arrive in America as business owners, primarily saloon keepers. That's the number one business that the famine Irish owned even within a year of arrival. Number two are grocery keepers. And then finally, as you can see, a tiny percentage of the famine immigrants are actually doctors and lawyers when they arrive in America. So we're going to start at the bottom of that socioeconomic ladder with day laborers and domestic servants. And so this is an image that was published right at the time showing day laborers and domestics on their way to work. So there are two things to know about this. First, you can see here the now this guy is a chimney sweep, obviously he's not a day laborer, but all these other people are day laborers. You can tell because they carried a shovel to work and that gives you some, uh, some uh, insight into their jobs, right? That was the thing you had to bring to work because mostly what you were doing was uh, digging cellars and moving debris and stuff like that. And so you can see not only did they bring that, but uh, even, you know, you think only today do we bring our hydro flasks uh, where we go, our water bottles, but even back then, your day laborers were bringing their water with them to work. Um, we also have here our servants. Now, these wouldn't have been your typical servants. The typical servant um, who was an Irish immigrant lived with their employers. That way they could get up in the morning before dawn, an hour before the rest of the family got up and start the fires and cook breakfast so that it was hot and ready when the rest of the family awakened. And then the servants would be the last ones up after everyone went to sleep. They would put out the fires, they would finish up, finish the cleaning and the uh, washing and the ironing to make sure everything was ready for the next day. These uh, servants who are going to work are the minority who actually just worked by day and were not the live-in servants. And so typically that would be people, the people who would employ them would be people who didn't have uh, big enough homes in which they could house a servant, right? So you had to be well enough off, they had an extra bedroom to, to uh, house your live-in servant. Now, I'll note, um, well, first let's get to, to day laborers. So day laborers work, I wanna point out, was very dangerous. Um, and this is an era before there was any kind of workman's compensation. Today, if a worker is killed on the job, um, their employer has paid into a fund that will pay for their burial uh, and for the for the um, for the undertaker services. Um, their family members, if they have any, will get uh, money for years afterwards to help them uh, get by with the loss of the if it's the primary breadwinner of the family. Back in this period, there was no such thing as workman's compensation insurance or anything of the like. So if you were killed on the job your family got nothing. If you were injured on the job, your family got nothing. In fact, if you were injured, the most likely thing that would happen is your employer would fire you uh, to make sure that they were not expected to pay any of your medical expenses. Now, an employer might voluntarily pay such expenses, um, but they were under no obligation to do so, and most of them did not. One of the biggest dangers of working on a construction site was having your building collapse before it was finished. This is an image of a building collapse in New York City. This was a warehouse. These are things like cotton bales that are being stored. They've come off a, a, of a ship from the South in this case, and they're being stored until they're purchased and shipped to either say Massachusetts or Rhode Island or, or England for that matter. Um, this building was damaged uh, by fire and before, and as the workers were trying to, to take the contents out, the building collapsed, killing uh, eight Irish immigrant employees. And so day labor was, was very dangerous work. Keep in mind, you know, construction work is one of the most dangerous jobs today. And that's with, uh, you know, with neon vests, with hard hats, with goggles. You didn't have any of those things back then. Now, not, as I said, not every unskilled person was a day laborer. One thing you could be instead was a porter. So porters would congregate at places like railroad stations, ferry terminals, um, places like that, um, streetcar stops, and offer to carry people's uh, luggage, 
which in those days, people didn't typically, when they traveled, you didn't have a suitcase in those days. That was a kind of a newfangled thing, the, the valise. Typically, when you traveled, you traveled with a trunk. And so you would pay somebody like this, an Irish immigrant, to, cal to carry your trunk. This trunk is getting off a ferry and, say, to your hotel. Um, porters earn more money than day laborers. Um, because the amount of money you earned, you know, a day laborer in those days made about a dollar a day. That was the standard pay. Porters, we can tell from the bank immigrant bank records, um, made about 25% more than day laborers. And that's mostly because the amount they made was determined by how hard they hustled, right? The, the faster you run through the city streets carrying this trunk, the faster you can get back to your ferry terminal and get another fare. In addition, um, negotiating was important and how well you treated the customers and cajoled them into giving you tips uh, also determined how much you got paid. So, but the problem was porters had no guaranteed uh, pay, right? So it's risky. Um, and so the more adventurous uh, people might try their hand at day labor, at being a porter. And, and we know from the bank records that the payoff was substantial, about 25% greater earnings uh, in terms of, as reflected in savings, than those for day laborers. Then if you did well as a hoarder, you might take your savings and invest it in a horse and cart and become a cartman. So again, you didn't have to be literate to be a cartman, but it worked the same way. You hustled for your jobs. Um, you also would negotiate your jobs. So a porter, I'm sorry, a cartman might go to a construction site and say, hey, I see you have lots of rubble there that you need carted away. I'll cart it away for you for this amount of money. Now, the cartman actually had, the city actually set the rates the cartman could get. But when, say, there, you know, it was the busy season for uh, digging, uh, for digging foundations, which would be in the spring, there might be a shortage of cartmen, and you might be able to negotiate a better, a better rate. Furthermore, the faster you hustled, the faster you got your, you know, the earlier you got up in the morning, the faster you got your first load to the, uh, um, you know, to the barge that was going to take the rubble out to sea, you got back to the construction site, the more runs you could make, the more money you made. And so Cartman earn, uh, and we can tell this from the bank records, 30% more than porters. So porters make 25% more than day laborers, Cartman make 30% more than porters. Uh, and so these are ways in which people who might start out as day laborers can do, can do better and never leave the unskilled ranks. Now, one of the things that was a significant impediment for Irish immigrant success, even in a place like New York that had you know, well over 100,000, this is a period when New York has about 600,000 uh, inhabitants and about a quarter of them are Irish born. Um, but discrimination plays a major role in limiting the kinds of upward mobility that people have. So you'll notice this first ad here on the top of the screen, Coachman Wanted, no Irish need apply. Now, most newspapers wouldn't refuse to run ads that said no Irish need apply. But in most cases, in most cases, those who didn't want to hire an Irishman could use some other means to get the point across. So you look at this third ad here, and it says you can be English, French, or German, right? Anything but Irish, basically, it says, without saying that. And then a further way that you could get that across is down here at the bottom. You can say, well, I want to hire men, but they must be Protestant. And since the famine Irish are overwhelmingly Catholics, that's another way to make sure that you don't get an Irish Catholic immigrant applying for your jobs. And so that's one reason that the Irish will especially go into jobs uh, that involve self-employment or even day labor, where... 90% of the day laborers in New York in this period are Irish. So you could be sure that if you wanted to get day labor work in, I in New York in this period, you wouldn't be discriminated against because you were Irish, because the Irish were pretty much all the people you could find to do the work. Now let's talk about domestic servants for a bit. Their jobs were, you know, as I've said, really hard. Um, and of course, most of the women who came to America and took jobs as domestic servants, had no experience with the, in the kind of uh, kitchen or household that they were now being expected to work in. So this ad is, a, this uh, uh, car cartoon is making fun of this Irish servant here because the, the lady of the house has said she wants her eggs soft. 
and my you've made my eggs hard and the bridget says oh i don't understand it i boiled them an hour that should have made them nice and soft right because all she knew about was boiling potatoes when she came to america and she knew that the longer you boiled the potatoes the softer they got and that wasn't the case of course with her eggs now i'm not going to talk very much about women today because the kind of method I use to track the famine immigrants doesn't work as well with women. Um, and that's because women, like these uh, domestic servants, overwhelmingly get married once they get to America, their last name changes and it becomes really hard to track them as a result. So let's talk about to what extent there was upward mobility for people in the unskilled category at the bottom rung of the socioeconomic ladder. So here's our ladder on the right. Now the spaces are the spaces reflect the size of the of the number of people on these rungs um, at the end of the famine immigrants' lifetimes. So as you can see here, of the people who start out as unskilled workers, only 59% of them remain unskilled workers for the rest of their lives. The other 41% move up the ladder. A few go up to being doctors and lawyers, mostly lawyers. Um, but it's interesting that the biggest bunch moved to become business owners. Um, in, that, in part, that's because, you know, running your own business, it gives you the opportunity to make the most money. Um, being an entrepreneur, as opposed to getting a wage here as a clerk or a, a wage as a journeyman, uh, say, shoemaker or carpenter. Um, but also, if you run your own business, you don't have to worry nearly as much about discrimination, right? There's no boss who might uh, treat you poorly because you're the one Irish employee. Um, and so 41% of those who I track who start out as unskilled workers end up as skilled workers. But then also significantly, among the 59% who stay at the quote-unquote bottom rung of the ladder, a lot of them move up from being day laborers where the pay is relatively low, to porters um, and, and uh, cartmen and, and, and jobs of that ilk, where they're going to make a lot more money than they did when they first started out in America. Now let's talk about the people who, who started out on the second rung of the ladder. These are the peddlers. Now, people on the streets of New York in the 1850s peddled just about every single thing you could buy in a store. Um, they just sold those things for a little less. Here are a couple of examples of peddlers. Here's a guy selling used hats, right? There wasn't much uh, demand for used hats in the, uh, you know, on Fifth Avenue or Broadway in New York from uh, well-to-do native-born Americans. But if you're an immigrant, you don't want to pay full price, you are very likely to buy a hat from a, an immigrant peddler, especially if they come from Ireland like you did. So here's a, an old hat peddler. This guy is an umbrella peddler. Um, umbrella peddlers made their own umbrellas in their tenement apartments when the weather was good. And then they took everything they had made when it got rainy and went out on the streets and sold umbrellas. If you go to New York City today, Anytime it rains, you see all of a sudden out on the street appear immigrants sell it, uh, peddling umbrellas. It was exactly the same in the 1850s, except in the 1850s, it was Irish immigrants who peddled them. Women also peddled. Women specialized in peddling fruit. Um, here you can see a kind of forlorn looking uh, elderly fruit peddler, uh, apple peddler. But some female uh, peddlers had quite large fruit stands. Now, again, you go to New York City today, and you're very likely to see on the streets large, sometimes quite um, impressive uh, fruit stands run almost entirely by uh, immigrants. And the same thing was the case in the 1850s, except those immigrants were all Irish immigrants. Oops. Now, sometimes peddlers specialized in certain, in certain things. So one thing that was popularly bought from peddlers on the streets of New York was charcoal. So your uh, stoves that you had in your uh, apartments, your tenement apartments, you tended to, to put charcoal in those stoves. 
and that would be both for cooking and for heating your apartment. The stove served as both the cooking device and the heat source in winter. And charcoal peddlers ended up, for some reason, coming from one part of Ireland. So if you look on the map here, this is the northern half of Ireland. Uh, County Tyrone is now in what's, uh, is what's the United Kingdom. And there was one parish in County Tyrone um, that gave New York almost all its charcoal peddlers. And we don't know exactly how that started, other than the fact that the very first uh, peddlers, uh, the, very, the very first charcoal peddlers, uh, how could I put this? Charcoal peddlers um, tended to buy their charcoal in a part of New York called Corlears Hook by the East River. The immigrants from Tyrone, for some reason, settled in that neighborhood. And then before you know it, they started peddling charcoal, probably because they bought it from these coal yards in that neighborhood. And by the 1850s, there were dozens of charcoal peddlers who had accounts at the Emigrant Savings Bank. And every single one of them, uh, save one, was from this parish in this county in uh, Ireland. And you find that in lots of different, uh, these, these kind of uh, niches are created by a lot of different, um, by the famine immigrants in lots of different ways. Um, on the screen here, you can see Killy Beggs. That is another part of, that's County Donegal. And lots of Irish peddlers in New York came from there. In fact, three quarters of the, all the Irish peddlers in, in New York came from Donegal and three quarters of the Donegal peddlers came uh, from Killy Beggs. And so it's these two contiguous counties that give New York the vast majority of its peddlers. And this is, this is what County Tyrone looks like, the part of County Tyrone where those charcoal peddlers came from. So as you can see, these immigrants had no experience, um, these immigrants had no experience uh, uh, with charcoal, right? There aren't enough uh, trees for them really to, it wasn't the source that they used for their fuel, but this is uh, what they used. Uh, this is where they came from. So let's talk about the peddlers' mobility and savings for a bit. Um, peddlers, peddlers saved um, a lot of money in their bank accounts. They saved about the same amount as saloon keepers. And, even, and this is hard to believe given that this was what your typical peddler in New York looked like. Um, but appearances were deceiving. And in part, the appearances were on purpose. They wanted you to sympathize for them, uh, with them. Um, and yet these peddlers, we can tell from their bank accounts, save a lot of money. Um, more not only than day laborers, but more than artisans, more than clerks, and more than uh, pretty much every kind of shopkeeper. Um, they were about the same, saved about the same amount as saloon keepers, a little less than saloon keepers, more than grocers, more than any other, every other group. Speaking of artisans, here's an interesting photo of old New York. Shows a row of shops. Here's a printer shop. Here's a carpenter shop. Here's a paint shop. Um, lots of Irish immigrants, as we've seen uh, from those numbers I gave you before, um, were in fact uh, start out as artisans. About a third of the Irish famine immigrants who come to New York start out as artisans. Now, what that shows you is a really important thing, that the immigrants, the famine immigrants who come to New York are not a cross section of the Irish population. Because if they had been, artisans would make up maybe 10% of the population, not a third. So the fact that so that a third of the famine immigrants immediately can start out as, as uh, artisans, printers, carpenters, and so forth, shows that it's not a cross section of the Irish who are coming to America. Um, the poorest of the poor can't afford to come to America. In those days, the fare, the ship fare, was about four to five British pounds. That equated to about 20 to 25 dollars. That would have been a month's pay for somebody back then. Furthermore, 
um, during the famine, people are, who are poor are spending every penny they have to buy food. So they didn't have enough money to pay for a ship fare. And then furthermore, uh, the ships didn't provide food. You had to bring your own food with you on the ship. And the typical journey took five weeks. So only people who had enough money that they could be unemployed a couple of months and could afford a five-week supply of food could get on a ship to go to America. Now, of course, some immigrants end up coming to America because somebody else pays, like we saw with John Lane and uh, Dennis Sullivan at the beginning. But that's a relatively small number. And the fact that that's a relatively small number is reflected in the fact that so many of these immigrants start out as artisans immediately upon landing in New York. There were more tailors from Ireland than any other kind of artisan. Um, these images on the right here are from the uh, pattern book of a famous Irish immigrant. He came, his name was Devlin. He came before the famine, um, but hired hundreds and hundreds of famine immigrants to sew clothing like this that he sold in his stores. And he was by 1860, one of the 10 richest Irish immigrants in America. He was uh, kind of uh, as famous as the Brooks brothers were before the Brooks brothers were famous. In fact, the Brooks brothers were kind of uh, Devlin's up and coming competitors during this period. This on the left here is the is a an advertisement of one of those uh, famine immigrants, George Fox, who comes to America also from County Tyrone, works as a journeyman tailor sewing clothes for a merchant tailor, but eventually saves enough money to open his own business and then advertises his cheap prices here, aiming his his uh, his business at other immigrants. Now, sometimes, though, immigrants could learn a craft in America. This was the case, for instance, with iron molders. So I tell in, in my book the story of one uh, famine immigrant who gets a job working at a big iron, uh, iron foundry in New York as a laborer, basically hauling around the raw materials, the, the, the iron ore that's going to be then smelted and made into the various pieces of of uh, iron that are used for building and so forth. But then we follow him through the bank records because he will open more accounts eventually. And so we can follow this and then through the census, he eventually moves up the, the uh, shop hierarchy and he becomes first a, uh, a uh, iron a smelter and then eventually an iron molder. And so, some immigrants are able to learn crafts in America, including the famine immigrants. Yet there's still that discrimination that we talked about to keep in mind. So one of the best paid um, and highest status um, crafts to have in New York City was to be a ship carpenter. So this was a distinct part of carpentry that meant that you had a specialization um, as you can see, it's quite a different kind of thing building a ship than it was to build a house. But the Irish are noticeably absent from ship carpentry. And, and I think that has to be because of discrimination. Because, so that unlike the foundries, where founders are um, teaching Irish immigrants some of the work involved there and letting them move up the shop ranks, that is not happening in the very highly paid ranks of the ship carpenters. So if we look at the upward mobility of the skilled workers, what we see is it's less than it was for the unskilled workers, which is interesting. Um, but about a quarter of the people who start out as skilled workers move up the hierarchy, primarily, again, becoming business owners. It's very hard, however, to track the upward mobility of skilled workers. I found one example, for, uh, for instance, of a painter. And he lists himself as a painter in the bank records, and he lists some stuff as a painter in the 1860 census, 1870 census, 1880 census. And the only reason I was able to determine that he went from being a painter who worked for somebody else painting, you know, worked for a painting contractor painting someone else's houses, to running his own paint shop and hiring other painters and uh, bidding for his own work was the fact that um, uh, around 1880, he disappears. And the newspapers say, where is he gone? We don't know where he's gone. And the next day, they report that he was found dead in the, um, in the bottom of a privy, that he had basically fallen through the seat into the bottom of an outhouse and had suffocated there. Um, this was the kind of outhouse that, you know, there, 
wasn't connected to the sewers. All the sewage was down there and he literally suffocates to death. And that was how he found. It. And the obituary says he was found in the back of his paint shop. And that's how I knew that he had actually become a business owner rather than someone who painted for a living. And so there have to be lots of cases like that who don't make news that are hard to trace. But we do know that a quarter of the skilled workers move higher up the ladder. So now we're almost to the top of the ladder. Uh, next to the top of the things I'm going to talk about today are the clerical and civil service workers. About 10%, as I said, of the civil of the clerks um, of the famine immigrants start out as clerks. Yet it's the it's the category that has the most occupational mobility. About half the people who start out as clerks end up higher up the occupational ladder, as you can see here. Um, most become business owners, but a large percentage become doctors and especially lawyers. So there are a lot of people who start out as clerks, um, event, end up getting legal training and become lawyers. And being a clerk was kind of uh, considered an important stepping stone to becoming a lawyer. A Abraham Lincoln, for example, is a law clerk before he becomes a lawyer. It's the same way that today somebody might work as a paralegal before they go to law school. Um, just to mention a couple of examples of, of clerks, we have one example, this fellow Hubert Glynn. He comes to America. He's already done a year of college in Ireland, but then with things looking so grim in Ireland, he comes to America. He's well-educated. He speaks Irish, which was important because a lot of the immigrants, the Irish immigrants, come to America not speaking English. And so the people before there was Ellis Island, which opens in 1892, there was Castle Garden, uh, which was the immigrant depot in New York from the 1850s to 1892 when Ellis Island opened. There were so many Irish immigrants coming who didn't speak English that the people who ran it, which was New York State at the time, decided they needed to hire somebody who knew who could speak Irish to talk to the Irish immigrants who couldn't speak English and take down the information that they would take down about each person arriving. So Hubert Glynn, who is well-educated, has a good hand, and speaks Irish, is hired. And he becomes the chief clerk of Castle Garden. He's the person who is the boss of all the people who take down this information. When somebody would come through who spoke only Irish, they would call for Hubert, and he would take down the information. And Hubert Glynn uh, was in charge of Castle Garden from when it opened in the uh, early 1850s um, until his death. Um, 35 years later, and he oversaw the uh, processing of more than 6 million immigrants. Then there are people who get these, what you might call lower status, white collar jobs, clerks, other civil service jobs, through things they do elsewhere. James Cavanaugh was a carpenter. Um, he was a carpenter who was part of, an, of a militia unit, the 69th Regiment. The militia units in those days were like the National Guard today. They drilled part-time, and then if there was an emergency, they would uh, help defend the country. And of course, that happens during the Civil War. The 69th is made part of the United States Army and goes and fights in all the major uh, Eastern theater battles of the Civil War. And Kavanaugh um, becomes uh, a colonel, leads the 69th Regiment in the uh, for the Union anyway, ill-fated uh, uh, attack on Robert E. Lee's forces at uh, Fredericksburg and is badly wounded there. But then after the war, he goes back to New York and he goes back to being a carpenter, um, working for other people doing, you know, working for contractors doing carpentry work. And as Kavanaugh gets older and, and, and gets into his 60s, people look and say, oh, it's such a shame, this hero, this person who helped save the nation is an employee of a contractor doing carpentry work when that's becoming really hard for him. And so his friends went to their, uh, their political representatives and managed to win Kavanaugh a civil service job uh, in the custom house, supervising the people who uh, were in charge of, of uh, determining, how much, determining the value of goods that were imported into the port of Brooklyn. Uh, and so he has this comfortable civil service job that he's able to keep for the last decade of his life uh, until he passes away around 1900. Now, the pinnacle of the ladder, and the last thing I'll talk about, um, are business owners. 
So rather than show where business owners end up, I thought I would show you instead where business owners come from. So the people who end up as business owners uh, among the Irish famine immigrants in New York, you can see they, they come from all lines of work. More of them start out as unskilled workers than anything else, but nearly as many start out as artisans. A good number come from here. And then only about a fifth actually start out as business owners uh, in New York. I'll just mention a couple of these. One that's my favorite is uh, are the Morgan brothers. The Morgan brothers start out as stable boys. They're teenagers when they arrive in New York, they're mucking out stables. And they board with some other immigrants who work making soda pop um, or what was known then as soda water, root beer, sarsaparilla, those kinds of things. And they think, huh, that'd be a good kind of job. That's better than mucking out stables. And so they managed to get themselves work at the same place that their boarding house mates work. They eventually start out their own, start their own soda business. Um, and the business becomes uh, extremely successful in New York. Um, it eventually, uh, they eventually buy out a Minnesota soda company that's known as White Rock. And White Rock Soda becomes a very well-known New York City brand that's still sold there today and still associated uh, amazingly with the Irish. A couple of other examples of uh, people who become uh, business owners. One is Lawrence Callanan. I love his story. He is the son of a grocer in County Cork. Um, he gets in trouble with his father for some reason. Um, his father says, there's going to be a whipping in this for you, but before I give you the whipping, you've got you've to take this uh, load of goods to Cork City and uh, bring them to the merchant who's buying them and collect the money. And then when you get home, you're going to get your, your whipping. Callanan doesn't want that. And so he goes to Cork, sells the goods, takes the proceeds from the sale, buys himself a ship ticket to America, mails the rest of the money back to his father, who by the time the envelope arrives and he wonders where his son is, the ship has sailed and he's on his way to America. Callanan moves in with an aunt who lives there, becomes a, a grocery clerk. Um, after a decade as a grocery clerk, he manages to open his own grocery. That doesn't do very well. So a, another grocer who is doing well says to Callanan, why don't you come work for me as my junior partner since you're not doing very well. And Callanan does that, and he eventually buys out his uh, partner when his partner retires, and he becomes a very prosperous and prominent wholesale grocer. Another uh, businessman is Andrew Kerwin. He starts out as a plasterer, but while he's working as a plasterer for, contract, for contractors and builders, he thinks, why can't I earn the profits that these builders own? So he becomes a builder. Here's an ad for one of the houses he built and was trying to sell. Now, at first, things don't go so well. He goes bankrupt, and his debts are $2 million in 1878, which today would equal about $60 million. But like lots of builders, he manages to uh, use the threat of not paying his debts to renegotiate his debt, and he eventually gets out of bankruptcy. And one of the things he does to succeed is he comes up with this idea that you know, in those days, nobody in New York wanted to live near the water because that was where the brothels were. That was where the longshoremen and the bars that catered to them were located. But Kerwin thinks, you know, if we could get rid of those people, it would actually be pretty nice to have a nice view. And so he buys up all this very cheap real estate, him and some partners, uh, along the river in what's now the East 50s of New York. And he redevelops it and he takes one block and actually puts it right by the river. The main place he develops is what becomes Sutton Place. But he also makes this other block even closer to the river here on that's called Riverview Terrace. And these houses are literally have not only a river view, but each one has its own terrace right out on the river. Uh, and this makes uh, Kerwin a wealthy man by the time he passes away around 1900. Now, of course, most business owners have much more modest success. You might open a boarding house like this operation here where an immigrant rents a tenement apartment, puts a lot of beds in it, and then rents spaces in the beds to the immigrants. Or you might do this, you might open a junk shop. You might find things along the waterfront and then spiff them up and sell them from your little junk shop. And if you couldn't even afford the rent, like this guy's uh, 
this couple has rented a basement here, which is super cheap. You might display your wares on a street corner or in a tenement yard. The pinnacle though for the famine immigrants was to open a saloon. That was what more of them aspired to do than anything else. Here, I'll just mention two uh, to wrap up, two famine immigrants who do that. One is Bernard Woods. He starts out as a day laborer, then works as a fireman, sets up a saloon eventually in Williamsburg, right across from the docks. And his claim to fame eventually becomes he buys the property next door to his tenement where his saloon is located that was a uh, it's kind of a little mini wooden amphitheater. Um, and he turns it into a what the press calls a miniature Madison Square Garden. And he rents that space out um, to unions that want to have meetings, to Irish nationalist organizations, to boxing matches, and so forth. And so he becomes famous in Brooklyn, not just for his saloon, but for his, his uh, uh, woods sporting grounds. A much more common situation would have been that of of uh, this immigrant named uh, Fenton, who was a gardener for his first decade in New York City, eventually opens a tenement north of Harlem. He lives a very modest life. Um, when he dies in 1897, um, uh, the, the uh, people uh, who are, evaluate his belongings for probate purposes say everything he has is worth $50. But then his, his uh, relatives say, well, what about this little tiny safe he has? And so when they open up the safe, they discover, um, they discover stock certificates and 30 bank books uh, whose value totals over $100,000, which would be today um, the equivalent of millions of dollars. Um, and you have plenty of immigrants like that who have been so scarred by the famine that they save um, that they save and save and save um, even when they have plenty of money and don't spend it because they're afraid of what happens if there's another disaster. I'll skip that one since we're out of time. I'll just mention finally that many immigrants move out of New York after spending years there. Um, many of them will become farmers like Peter Lynch who I talked about at the beginning of my talk, who goes to the prairie. Um, it didn't look quite like this. This is, uh, this is uh, a little more wide open than Minnesota would have been, where there would have been trees um, and, and become farmers. But what I will point out is that those who left New York didn't typically go far. Half, in those days, New York City was just Manhattan. It's only in 1898 that the city um, grows to become, to include Brooklyn and what's now Queens and the Bronx. Most of the famine immigrants who leave New York don't go any farther than New Jersey or Brooklyn. But of those who do leave, um, the, the most popular destination, if you leave New York State, is New Jersey. And the second most popular destination is California. Just to mention two briefly, um, one is Patrick Drew. He's a Mason. He moves to Milwaukee and, like Andrew Kerwin, becomes a builder and a state legislator there. And then James Regan, I love his story. He's a candy maker in New York. He moves to California to try to strike it rich in the gold rush, fails at that, starts making candy in San Francisco. He discovers that the, that the miners have uh, an unquenchable thirst for candy. And so he becomes a huge wholesaler of candy in San Francisco and in the gold mining areas. He smartly invests his profits um, in San Francisco downtown real estate. And so becomes probably the wealthiest person of anyone I studied because he bought up uh, all these lots in downtown San Francisco in the 1850s. And as San Francisco grows, he becomes wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. And that was the main thing I learned in my study is that the best way you could assure yourself success in America was to buy real estate because you could, you could fritter away your profits if you... Uh, kept in the bank through drink, through gambling. But if you had real estate, that was something that was really hard to do badly at. So finally, because I've gone now over time, let's look at the socioeconomic ladder before and after. Here was where people were when we started, right? 46% unskilled, only 5% business owners. 
And look where the famine immigrants are after 20 years or more in America. This is, these are people who I could track 20 or more years. Only a quarter of them are now unskilled and a third of them are business owners, right? So that's very different than the uh, way that historians have portrayed the famine immigrants as, as locked in poverty. Um, and so that fact alone, the fact that the number of unskilled has gone down and the fact that so many, now you have nearly half the famine immigrants are white collar, whereas only 15% of them were at the beginning, I think shows that first, the famine immigrants were very, uh, very um, determined savers. This is an image of depositors at the immigrant savings bank. Notice it's primarily women who are going and putting the family savings into the bank. I think that's really interesting. Um, that the famine immigrants were great savers and they used that savings to open businesses and to give themselves opportunities. And even more so to give their children opportunities. So that's my talk. I'm sorry I went over my 50 oh, okay. Now we've got plenty of time for questions. Uh, let me get in. Mm -hmm. Ah. Yes, there's plenty of questions, but I just have to address uh, one question. Uh, <laughs> unrelated. Uh, the May 22nd pro yeah, is on Monday. And that's about uh, women in architecture. So that was a question out there. There was a, there was a miss. Uh, I think the date was put out as, as the 25th is actually when it is the 22nd. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, if you address uh, participation in politics, were there any obstacles in registering to vote and gaining political funds? I mean, the clerk moved, you know, moved to politics or yeah yeah no i understand the question it's a great question so were there obstacles the answer is yes and no so on the one hand the irish could vote after five years in america so by the middle 1850s the irish in new york and really all over the united states have quite a bit of political power where the obstacles lay were in getting political offices commensurate with those numbers. And so we think of things like the Tweed Ring, which becomes the famous Democratic Party political machine in New York in the 1860s. We think of that as dominated by the Irish. And definitely by the 1870s, it's dominated by the Irish. But in the 1850s and 60s, the Irish are constantly complaining that we give you the majority of your votes, but you don't give us any of the good political offices. And so what happens is, um, is that that's the, the kind of area of contention. And the Irish keep complaining, you take our votes, you don't give us the good, the good offices, the congressional seats, the mayoralties, the things like that. You give us the, the, you know, the unimpressive positions like aldermen and, and things like that. And so the big fight in, uh, between the Irish Democrats and the non-Irish Democrats is for citywide offices. And the Irish really only succeed at getting the number of those commensurate with their numbers after Boss Tweed, who actually starts out in the 1840s at the beginning of his career as a nativist, as an anti-Catholic, uh, as a politician who espouses anti-Catholicism. It's only when Boss Tweed goes to jail in the 1870s that the Irish come to, uh, to really dominate democratic politics in New York. Yeah, kind of unrelated. Well, it is related because uh, we always hear a lot about the Irish policemen in New York City. When do they start, uh, you know, uh, moving into uh, into I guess law enforcement? <laughs> sure. The it's by the 1850s the Irish are are becoming policemen in large numbers. There's a fight about that in the mid 1850s with the rise of the Know Nothing Party. The Know Nothing Party is the anti-immigrant and specifically anti-Catholic and anti-Irish political party that grows in response to the famine immigrants and becomes very popular in 1854 and 55. And one of the things the Know Nothings do in New, in New York State is um, believing that the Irish who are becoming policemen are preventing the laws that are supposed to limit 
uh, the sale of liquor and banned the sale of liquor entirely on Sundays, believing that the Irish were preventing those laws from being enforced. Uh, know nothings combined with nativist Republicans to ban uh, to uh, disband the New York City Police Department, which has a good number of Irish immigrants, and replace it with a state-run force that requires all the policemen to be native-born. Um, the Irish get very angry at that. Um, there's a big riot in New York in 1857 as a result. But what happens is um, by 1858, a year after that natives only police force started, the New Yorkers realized even, even the, uh, the, the nativists that they can't really police New York without Irish immigrants. And so they start letting immigrants back on the police force. Oh. Mm -hmm. And the Irish then come to dominate the police force by the end of the Civil War, so 1865. Yeah, yeah. kind of a related question is that um, with all the discrimination against the Irish and employment, you know, you have to be, you can't, can't be Irish. How did Irish, did some Irish just finagle uh, who they were or, you know, or, or you know, outright lie or, or yeah. Or just like somehow get into these uh, these uh, uh, employment positions that were only uh, only non-Irish. So you do find that sometimes um, Irish try to pass for non-Irish, um, but overwhelmingly that's Irish Protestants who don't want to be lumped with Irish Catholics. And so I found in the bank records, you know, as I tracked these, these immigrants who, when they opened their bank account in the 1850s, said, I'm born in Ireland. Here's exactly the place in Ireland I'm born. So we know they really were. And when I find them in 1870 or 1880 uh, and the census taker comes to their door, they say, oh, no, I was born in Scotland, not Ireland. Um, and we see, I see that with some regularity. But Irish Catholics tended not to do that. Um, Instead, they fought to end the discrimination rather than try to pretend that they were something they were not to, to not be discriminated against. And then the, the biggest thing they did to avoid discrimination was, as I said, self-employment or to get jobs from other Irish immigrants, right? So, so a lot of the famine immigrants would get jobs from the pre-famine immigrants who had already moved up the ladder before they had. Mm. Mm. Um. Yeah, for Irish who could not afford passage to America, uh, do you know where such uh, destinations is? That where they, where did they go? Did they go to uh, Australia, Canada, Newfoundland, or you don't know? No, I do know. That's a great question. So, if you couldn't afford to go to America, but you could afford to go somewhere, the first place you would go is England. So, England has lots of Irish immigrants in this period. Not nearly as many as the United States, because most of the Irish hate the English because the English have colonized Ireland. So while if you can't afford to go to America, you might go to England, you mostly go to England hoping you can save up enough money in England to then afford a fare to North America. Now, up until the middle of the famine, it was cheaper to go from Great Britain to Canada than the United States. So you have a lot of immigrants who go to Canada because it's cheaper than going to the United States. Most of those Irish immigrants who go to Canada, however, will eventually come to the United States for the same reasons I've said. They see Canada as yet another colony of England, another place where they are unfree. They see the United States as a place of freedom, and so they want to come to America. Um, by the middle of the famine, there's such a huge um, number of ships going from Liverpool to America that it's actually cheaper. And, and also because the Canadians don't want the Irish anymore either. So they start making the fare. They start imposing uh, restrictions on the famine immigrants. And so by that point, then it's cheaper to go to New York than it is to Canada. Now it is, however, free to go to Australia. They're so desperate to get people to go to Australia that you can go to, for, to Australia for free, no. but it's so far no. away um, that Australia only gets a tiny number of Irish immigrants. Significant given how few people go from Great Britain to, to Australia, but still tiny in, in terms of the world migration. Yeah, how, well, 
other question is uh, how fatal were the was ship passage uh, uh, to America from Ireland? I that's mean, another, uh, that's another great question. And so, at the very beginning of the famine, um, deaths were very common. And of course, everything here is relative because just dying in those days was very common, right? This is before antibiotics, before anybody understands um, how disease spreads. And so, so at the very beginning of the famine in 1847, which is the peak year uh, early on in the famine, you'll have something like five out of every 100 passengers on a ship to Canada will die. Now, mm -hmm. The United States had higher, had more stringent health standards than, than the Canadians had in terms of who you could put on a ship and the conditions on the ship. So initially, ships coming to America, only about two out of every, uh, only about one out of every hundred would die on the voyage to America versus five out of every hundred going to Canada. Once you had that first year with five out of every hundred dying, that's nobody likes that. That's why those ships become known as coffin ships. Then the British increase the standards in terms of doctors who have to be on board, not letting sick people get on a ship. And so by 1848, 1849, uh, it becomes about one out of every 100 dying on a ship. Um, mm -hmm. And that was the rate it had been before the famine. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, here's a, a question about, well, I don't know if we can compare. <laughs> so you did. You did. Um, the experience of the Italian Americans who immigrated later uh, to the Irish, to the Irish, not Italian Americans, the Italians who, who uh, sure. immigrated. So I, I talk about that actually in some detail in my previous book, City of Dreams. So I'm I'm uh, very well able to talk about that. Oh, okay. That book, by the way, is a history of immigrant life in New York City. So I kind of cover each wave of immigrants Ooh. in New York from the Dutch all the way to the there present. So. One of the transitions I have in that book is where we go from the Irish to the Italians and the Eastern European Jews. Um, so obviously there's some similarities. Both groups are overwhelmingly Catholic. Um, both groups are very poor when they arrive in America. Um, one of the, so another similarity is the fact that just as the native born uh, Americans treat the Irish very badly when the uh, Irish get to America. The Irish Americans, who by this point are not immigrants anymore, but now the children of those immigrants or the grandchildren, <laughs> uh, treat the yes. Italians very badly when they get to America. And that's that's something that's kind of a uh, a standard thing in America is that each ethnic group treats the newest one as badly as the previous one treated them when they arrived in America. Um, and then the Italians and the and the other big similarity is both groups dominate construction and day labor, right? They, so the Irish are the big day laborers in New York until the Irish, until the Italians arrive, and then the Italians become the big day laborers in New York. Um, if you want to know more, mm. you should definitely definitely <laughs> check out <laughs> City of Dreams, and you can you can learn in great detail. Yeah, the question of course, for me. I mean, I know you know to create the start business requ requires some assets and. Uh, was there any problems with uh, the Irish uh, getting getting bank loans or accumulating assets to start a business, or did they get help from their friends or, or other other Irishmen? Great question. It's it's a complicated answer, so I'll give the simple version. So, okay. <laughs> first of all, it's amazing how little money it took to start a business. So take Lawrence Callanan, remember the guy I mentioned before who ran away rather than take a whipping at home and yeah. came to America? He writes, he writes a memoir, a little biographical sketch. He says he started his grocery with $50. And that's oh. because, so $50 back then would be roughly the equivalent of $1,500 today. So you might say, how is that mm. possible? So what he said was, all I needed was enough money for my first month's rent on my on my storefront. Oh, and all the okay. wholesalers who were who wanted my business competed with each other and offered to sell me my stock on credit. So he said all I needed was $50 to start my business. Mm. 
Now, what if you started a business? What if you needed more money than that? Because not everyone could start their business for $50. So you didn't get bank loans in those days, especially if you're an immigrant to start a business. You would typically get a loan from another immigrant. So if you're a saloon keeper, um, you don't want to put all your money in the bank because, you know, there's no FDIC insurance in those days. The bank might go bankrupt and you lose your money. So you put some money in a bank because the interest payments are great, but other money you lend out at steep rates of interest to other immigrants. Mm. And so that was the way that immigrants typically got the loans they needed. And then the other thing you did was save. And we can see very often in the immigrant bank records, the immigrant saves, you know, 50, 100, 150, up to, might take them five years to save $500. And then they take that $500 out of the bank they start a dry goods business. Hmm. Um, and so sometimes we can track that very, very well between the bank records and other records we have. So savings, loans from other immigrants, and the fact that it often didn't cost that much to start a business. Right. Uh, here's, uh, uh, what percent of civil servants were police? So... Can you tell? <laughs> So the percentage of civil servants who were policemen in New York was small. The percentage of Irish civil servants uh, who were policemen was large, right? So the Irish had a disproportionate, a disproportionate number of the Irish who were civil servants were policemen. Oh. Um, so that's, that's the answer to that question. Uh. And uh, how many Irish women came um, to America as indentured servants? Zero. That's just no such thing zero. as indentured servitude by the, well, if we're talking about the famine, it's zero. No, but there are no indentured servants. Serv indentured servitude is, has been done away with by the time of the end of the American Revolution. So okay. uh, 19th century, no indentured servitude in the United States. Okay, and in the picture of a, uh, okay, in the picture of the men carrying shovels, mm -hmm. what were the women carrying? It looks like babies. I don't know. Mm, let's go. Oh, I know. that's a, that's like an illustration. It's not a real picture. All the way back here, take a look at that. Look. There is. Oh. Oh no. Oh. Parcels. Yeah, that is true. There are a couple. Of... So I'm going to guess because, um, because it specifically says these people are on their way to work. I am going to guess that those are not babies, even though it does definitely look like that, and say those are bundles of, say, groceries and, or things that oh, they're okay. bringing to work with them. Because it definitely says that the, the caption that you can't see says laborers and domestics on their way to work. Mm. Okay, and um, was the potato famine caused by wind blowing a mold off American ships passing by Ireland? Oh, that's a, that's a scary. Close. So it is wind blown, but no, it, 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 it happens this way. Um, so the, the, the mold, it's not really a mold, it's a bacteria, but we'll, we'll call it mold for our purposes. Um, not even a bacteria, but I'm not a scientist, but it's, so it's mold-like, let's put it that way. So American farmers use guano to, to fertilize their fields. They buy their guano from Central and South America. The guano has the disease in it. The disease is then used to fertilize American potato fields. Americans take little tiny potatoes and sell them to Europe as seed potatoes. So big potato plants grow from little potatoes. Those potatoes come from America because America has hot, dry summers. The potato plants which have this disease in them don't die because it's too hot and dry for the, for the mold or whatever you want to call it to, to uh, multiply. But when those same diseased potatoes are planted in Ireland's moist, wet soil with its cloudy, su oh. cool summers, that's what causes it. So no, it can't blow off a ship. Those potatoes are brought to Ireland, they're planted in the ground, and that's what causes it. But then the disease spreads 
through the air to other potato plants. So there is some, there is airborne spreading once it's in Ireland, but it doesn't get to Ireland in the air. Yeah, I have the question about policemen again. Is this, uh, why did so many Irishmen be, uh, become policemen? Was there any, anything that motivated them? Great or question, just... and there's an easy answer. When you look at the Emigrant Savings Bank records and you plot from lowest to highest, the average savings of uh, the average savings of the Irish immigrants, number one is saloon keeper, number two is policeman. So oh. policemen make <laughs> a lot of money. Oh. Now, it's not all Economic. salary. It's not all salary. The other thing is in those days, in those days in New York City, if you were robbed, the police would say, oh, it's a shame. That guy disappeared, we can't find him. If you really wanted to get your stuff back, you would hire a policeman on their off-duty hours to oh. moonlight as a detective to try to find whatever it is that was stolen. Then, of course, there are bribes that are paid by saloon keepers. Hey, I really want to sell my booze on Sunday to all my workers who work six days a week. How about look the other way and I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, I won't, I won't make it really clear that my saloon's open, but don't arrest me. So between bribes and moonlighting, policemen next to uh, saloon keepers make the most money. And that's why it's such a valuable job. Okay. Um, see if I, uh, it, the Irish gangs became, became most important during what year and did their ownership of bars lead to their involvement in gangs? So this is a really complicated question. Um, gangs don't own bars. Um, so it's, unfortunately, we need a whole lecture to really answer this question. It, it's- Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's, it gets into uh, organized crime and says, well, you know, you pay, you pay- uh, Well, yeah. the truth is it doesn't- You pay somebody get, for protection. Yeah. It does, no, no, not really. So no? this, is, this is a period before before organized crime exists. So a much more okay. typical situation would be um, like that saloon, that saloon picture I showed you guys briefly, um, that saloon keeper um, on the wall of that saloon was, um, were targets that a militia unit had uh, that met at the saloon would post and show the targets where they had made bullseyes. So that militia unit might meet at the saloon. Uh, the members of that militia unit might show up at uh, polling places on election day to support that saloon keeper's bid for, say, aldermen. And in those days, um, each candidate might bring toughs to the polls to try to dissuade the other side's voters from voting. And so going, going to, to vote in the 1850s or 1840s in New York, you took your life into your hands sometimes, especially if you were in an Irish neighborhood. So your quote unquote Irish gang was much more likely to be a group that hung out at a bar that was loyal to the saloon keeper and might lend muscle on election day. And so the link between gangs and crime is not really one that exists in this period. Uh, unless of course uh, you consider beating people up at the polls crime, which of course it is. But the, the, those people weren't people who were like robbing people or criminals in the organized crime sense that will happen later. So that is a way where really the Italians and, and the Eastern European Jews and German immigrants and, and Irish immigrants, but later um, create organized crime in the, in the way we have it and we think of it today. Um, but that doesn't exist in the 1850s. There's crime, but it's disorganized and there are criminal gangs, but they're not the gangs who make headlines. The gangs that make the headlines are more gangs that riot, and those tend to be for political reasons. Um, yeah. Do you have any idea how many of, uh, I guess, sabers were English speakers versus Gaelic speakers? Gaelic speakers? Sure. Um, the answer is, is it's hard to know. What we do know is the bank would write it down when someone only spoke Irish. And that was the term that that's the term that tends to get used today is Irish rather than Gaelic. So we know that the number who spoke only Irish was very small. But we do know that 
but we can surmise from other things that the number that spoke both some English and some Irish was pretty high. And that would mostly depend on where you came from. The more isolated parts of Ireland you came from, the West would be more Irish speakers. The more you came from the East and North, fewer Irish speakers. But we don't know the exact numbers in America. Yeah, I mean, were there, well, uh, well, what percentage of the, of the banks were, were Irish owned? Um, I guess that would be hard to know. New York, New York has one. One. <laughs> one, okay. And, and eventually this becomes, no, I mean, so after the Emigrant Savings Bank does well, Germans open their own right. savings bank. But no, banks were mostly organized around other other common attributes, mostly around work. So the sailors had their own bank, um, right. known as the Siemens Bank for Savings. Some some of you uh, folks are, are probably old enough to remember that. Um, other labor groups had, had their own banks. Um, and then because in those days you didn't have branches, you just had one location, banks were much more kind of neighborhood oriented. So there was the Bowery Savings Bank on the Bowery. Um, and so so right. not so many organized by ethnic group. Uh, okay, does your book include uh, the story of the oldest Irish saloon in New York? But the Kinley's old ale house? McSorley's, McSorley's. Um, no, okay. McSorley's. no it, it doesn't because McSorley wasn't a famine immigrant and I'm focusing on the famine oh, okay. migration. McSorley okay. came later. He's a post-famine immigrant. Okay. Um, Though I wish he was me. because it would be it would be nice to actually be able to have a picture of an actual saloon. Um, well, I think you already explained that. To what extent does your uh, research and uh, reflect the experience of other immigrants? Well, I think you already is. Yeah, Italians, and I think you have the other books, previous books, you talk about the immigrant experience in New York. Yeah. Well, not only that, but the fact that I think what the questioner is getting at is the, the what what uh, the theme of my previous book, City of Dreams, is that every immigrant group's experience is pretty much the same. Like the specific details are different, right? You might eat pasta instead of potatoes. And you might live on the Lower East Side instead of in Five Points. But the basic outlines of the story are almost always identical. And they vary very little. Immer the immigrant experience in New York is, for every immigrant group, no matter the century, is, is almost always very much the same. Well, unfortunately, I'm sorry. <laughs> we have a few more questions. Okay, maybe I can answer one more. Uh, we're, we're at 4.30. Were Irish immigrants among those who per perpetrated the race riots during the Civil War? Correct. The Irish immigrants, uh, and that's talked about in the book. I didn't have time for that today. Um, Irish immigrants were disproportionately represented in the rioters who rioted uh, in opposition to the draft riots and you know, the draft riots were were quite terrible, um, especially in terms of the lynching of Black New Yorkers uh, that took place during the riots. Uh, the rioters tended to destroy the property of white, of their white victims and to lynch their Black victims. So it's a, a terrible, a terrible story in New York's history. But yes, the, the, the Irish were disproportionately involved. Perfect. Yeah, unfortunately, we're even past time now. <laughs> so um, this is you know, fascinating uh, discussion on, you know, and presentation, because I, mean, I didn't know about this. Uh, it seems that the Irish really had a, a really strong upper mobility, you know, uh, when they came here. You know, I, you know, I assume some of it was because they were killing, coming from a really bad situation so it's like i mean i think maybe with the resilience that uh okay you know just to keep on going and keep on you know working at it so um, in part i think it's resilience and in part i think that the famine i the famine irish were very entrepreneurial and 
the English looked at the Irish and thought, oh, they're just all, they're all lazy. And, but in fact, they were not lazy. They were suppressed by, uh, you know, what you might call the, the chains of colonialism. And once the Irish had freed themselves from those chains, they were able to prosper. Hmm. Well, we're past time. <laughs> a lot more questions. that people were really interested in the uh in well, your, what in you can tell what you can feel free to tell people is it's easy to send me an email if you want to ask a question my email address is just my last name and binder at gwu.edu where i oh, great 26 okay. years and i'm happy to answer more questions via email okay all right well thank you very much this is just a fascinating uh uh discussion and a lot of interest in this and so um going to have to wrap it up. <laughs> so thank you very much. It's a sure, very interesting you, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for those who came.